I'm a neuroscientist, and I spent the last six and a half years in graduate school getting a PhD to understand this. It's the brain. And the reason why I had to go to graduate school, because that's the only place where you could actually get hands-on experience working with the brain to understand how it works. And that's actually a bit of a shame because one out of five of us, as 20% of everybody in this room, will be diagnosed with a neurological disorder. And so it seems a shame that the only people that get to understand how the brain works and get to work with the brain are the specialists that are already dedicated their lives to that. That should be something that everybody can sort of get a little understanding about how the brain works. And I like to uh, make an analogy to astronomy. And the equivalent would be that in order to be able to look at stars, you'd have to get a PhD in astrophysics. And that's ridiculous. I mean, if you wanted to, you could spend about 50 euros and go to the store and pick up a telescope. But it may not be the best telescope in the world. But you'd be able to look through and see the heavens and maybe understand a little bit of how the stars and, and the planets move. And that might interest you in becoming an uh, uh, astronomer. Uh, but there's nothing like that in neuroscience today. I mean, it, like I said, the only way you can do that is to get a you know, graduate school and spend years in a lab and become a neuroscientist to actually understand really how the brain works. And so uh, when I was in grad school, I decided with my lab mates that we we're going to go out and try to change that. And so we would go into schools and we would do things with kids to try to get them interested in the brain. And so we did uh, things like this, this paper mache Frankenstein, which had an ice cream brain. And we would have kids come up and scoop out a part of the brain, and we would transfer that lesion to the student. So let's say like, they took out the motor cortex. We would tie their hands down for a few minutes so they realized that they couldn't move, that the, the motor cortex was responsible for moving. And we do the same thing with the visual cortex. If you scoop out a bit of the visual cortex, we would put like blinders on. And we can do this over and over again. And they sort of talked a little bit about like what parts of the brain does what, but not really what's happening inside the brain. And so in order to do that, we had to figure out a way to take this really expensive lab equipment we had in the lab, which was about $40,000 worth of equipment, and make it simple enough and affordable enough and easy enough for that kids can use inside the classroom. And so around that time, my lab mate and I decided to come up with a project, and we called it the $100 spike. Next slide, please. Uh, and so this was a, a self-imposed engineering challenge, which was to take uh, all this lab equipment and make it affordable enough so that, you know, anyone can record the neural impulse of a living brain cell. And so that was what we started to work on. And we had six months to sort of complete this challenge because we were going to present it at a scientific conference. And so this is what it looked like. So that's Tim Marzullo. That was my lab mate. Uh, and that's me there. And what we had is uh, some piece of equipment that didn't quite work that well. Uh, here's a close-up. of These are micro-manipulators made out of wood and wing nuts. And we things, tied these things together. We had a circuit that almost worked. But even though it didn't work, people really, really, really liked it. I mean, the scientists came up to us, and they kept saying, when can we buy one? When can we buy one? But we actually weren't doing it to sell it. We were just trying to show that it can be done. Uh, and we were using it for ourselves. But enough people kept emailing us. We decided, hmm, you know, this may be a good idea to sort of start something with. And so we made an organization, a company called Backyard Brains. And we started with, the, with these simple prototypes, uh, which you can see on the far left. And we worked our way over the, over the next year and sort of developed a more advanced version of that, and, which is what this is right here. This is called the Spiker Box. And this allows you to do what we did in the lab. It allows you to record living brain cells from neurons in the palm of your hand using a 9-volt battery. This is an open source project that we've developed. And instead of having big racks of computers to analyze the brain, we use something that the kids already had. They already have mobile devices. And so you're able now, with some open source software, to plug into your mobile phone and actually see the spikes, or actually see how the brain works, and actually hear how the brain works as well. So you can actually start to manipulate with the brain and actually do really cutting edge neuroscience down from the fifth grade level on up. And, the, and we have lessons that as you go through life, that the lessons get a little bit more difficult. OK, so now I'm going to uh, do a couple demonstrations. But before I do that, I just want to talk a little bit about the brain. I'm not sure how much everyone here knows exactly how the brain works. Uh, this is the reason why I went to grad school. But I'll just give you a quick primer. The, uh, the brain is made out of 100 billion cells. And these cells are called neurons. And this is just like a normal cell. But it has the strong, this long extension that reaches out. And that cell, that, that 
extension is called an axon. And it's down this axon that all information is passed from one cell to the other, okay? And it comes in the form of electricity. And so an electricity comes all the way down and it reaches out and it, it does something to another cell which either increases or de decreases the voltage inside that cell and then it may fire an action potential and that goes on to another cell and to another cell and to another cell and pretty soon this is how all of our brain functions, like all of everything from the peripheral system into our brain into consciousness which we don't quite understand how that works yet but then from there out from our motor cortex down to our muscles, this is all passed around with this special electric message and this message is called something neat, it's called a spark. And so that was the name of our spiker box, is it allows kids to be able to record and see these spikes and manipulate them to understand a little bit about the very essence of how our brain works. All right, so I'm going to do a demo right now just to sort of show you how it works, uh, but I'm not going to use my brain, and I'm not going to take a volunteer to use one of their brains right now, but I am going to use our insects. And so you're probably thinking, like, why would I use an insect if I want to learn how the brain works? Well, it turns out that in insects have very, very similar... Uh, neurons that we do. And so we have more. I said we had 100 billion cells, uh, excuse me, 100 billion neurons in our brain. These guys have about 1 million, so they have a lot less of them. But if you actually looked at the individual neuron, they're very, very similar. They have a lot of similar properties. So we're going to record the brain of this cockroach. And the first thing we have to do is we're going to have to do a surgery. So I'm going to knock him out. So get this guy here. So as you can see, he's definitely uh, alive and kicking. You know, ooh, he <laughs> and he's been well trained to go directly into the ice water. So we're going to put him in, into some ice water. And the reason why we're going to do that is because we're going to anesthetize him. Because one of the things we need to really teach our children is that it's really important to talk about you know, how we handle animals in laboratory settings. And so we want to make sure that we anesthetize these animals because if you ever had a surgery, you don't want to be awake when you're having your surgery. And so what the ice water does is since they're cold-blooded, it basically stops their neurons from firing, these little ion channels that slow down and stop moving. And so when the uh, neurons stop firing, the animal stops moving, and it also stops feeling pain. And so this is a way to sort of numb the animal so we can do a surgery, and then the animal won't feel it. And the other thing that's nice about this, we're going to take off a leg in a minute, uh, and, but what's going to happen is that insects are also very cool. They have a way to sort of regenerate their legs, and they can regenerate antenna. And the other thing that's cool about it is they also breathe through their skin, and so that leg, even though it will be removed, will still be alive. So I'm going to go ahead and do that surgery right now, now that he's anesthetized. So you saw him moving before. So now we'll take a look at it. He's no longer moving. But he is still alive. People ask that question often. So I'm going to come in here, and I'm going to take a pair of scissors, and I'm going to cut his leg off like that. All right. I know, gross. <laughs> but for me, it's not. It's actually quite beautiful. So let's take a look at why we're going to do what we're doing. Why am I cutting off a leg if I'm talking about his brain, right? Well, if you actually looked inside of this, of this close-up, you can see there's a lot of little hairs running up and down the, hair, up, running up and down, down the leg, and those hairs are very beautiful, and they, they allow him to climb up walls, but they also do something very important to the cockroach. It sends information to the brain. And so there's neurons living in each one of those hairs that are sensing vibrations, you know, or sending wind. So when you open up a door and you turn the lights on, these things are scurrying away. And the reason why, they've already felt you coming because they're really, really, really good at detecting wind and detecting vibrations. And so they're already aware that you're coming, and that's why they're so hard to catch. So the next thing uh, I'm going to do is I'm going to take some pins because each neuron sends that axon all the way up to the brain. So the axon is running through that center of the leg. So if we take some metal pins and plug them in there, metal conducts electricity. That little voltage is going to come into the spiker box, and we're going to be able to amplify it, and we're going to be able to hear it, and then we're going to be able to see it. All right, is everyone with me? All right. So I'm going to go ahead and take the leg. I'm going to stick it into our invention here. I'm putting one pin, like you saw before, in the femur, and another pin in the coxa. And another nice thing about this is there's really no right way or wrong way to sort of do this. So it makes it really, really nice for doing educational things. All right, I'm going to turn it on, and when I do, you're going to hear, possibly for the first time, exactly what's happening inside your brain. These are neurons inside the cockroach legs, which are the same as the neurons inside of our brain. So I'll go ahead and turn it on. I'm going to turn up the, the volume a little bit. So what does that sound like to you guys? I, when I ask students that, they always tell me it sounds like, they tell me it sounds like popcorn popping. 
Uh, or they'll tell me it sounds like raindrops. Uh, but to me, it's the most beautiful sound in the world because this is what your brain does. And so let's take a look at what your brain looks like. So I'm going to turn on my iPad here. And so what you're seeing, those are spikes. Those are those action potentials that are passing by that axon. And so now we can do an experiment, because remember what I said before, that the, the, uh, the spikes are sort of responding to touch vibrations, right, or wind vibrations. So if we can do an experiment and touch this leg, we can see if we see a response in this activity. So what are you seeing? You're seeing an increase in the, in the action potentials, the number of spikes that are happening per second. And so that's something that we call rate coding. And this is something that took a while in neuroscience to do, but now kids can do that themselves right there in the classroom. So go back to the slides, please. So this is, what, um, this is kind of a blow up of what we just saw. This is uh, some data that we, so we're, we're publishing data on how students learn. It turns out the kids actually learn neuroscience by doing these experiments. Uh, what we show here is uh, just a blow up of that data we saw that when you touch the leg, you get an increase in firing rates. And that's how information is encoded from the sensory system back up to the brain. And so it's nice because it's a portable device. You can bring it everywhere. This is a student that saw a spike for the very first time. And I love this picture because you can see his face. And it's not a doctored photo. He's like, experiencing exactly what's going on inside of his brain, which is kind of a beautiful thing. All right, we can bring this around. We've, we've introduced, we try to keep track of how many people have seen spikes for the first time because of our invention. So it's 20,000 people and counting have seen spikes for the very first time. And it's portable, you can bring it anywhere. We can even bring it onto an airplane. We had an airline stewardess give us the ice. We have anesthetized the animal. We put up a sign in the bathroom saying that come to seats 35A and B and you can learn about neuroscience. We sat there for four hours on a flight to California and just did neuroscience lessons over and over again. So it's a beautiful little invention. But it's not, just, it's not just spikes that we can do, right? There's a lots of things you can, you can study in neuro, which is why the brain is so interesting. Uh, what else you can do is something that Galvani did over 300 years ago. And that was like, there was, it was unknown at the time. They knew animals had electricity, and they knew that there was electricity out in the heavens, but they didn't know if those two were related. So he did a really neat experiment. And what he did was he hooked up wires up to the, to the top of the roof and then hooked the other legs up to nerves of frog legs that he had there. And he let the lightning strike, and he would capture the lightning, but he would also see what would happen to the frog legs uh, when we do that. So we can actually do that in the classrooms uh, from fifth grade on up. And we, we're going to do that experiment now, but we're not going to use uh, lightning. What we're going to use is our uh, cell phones. And so we can play MP3s. And what you may or may not know is a battery inside of here that goes to your earbuds. And when your earbuds sort of like send the current by magnets, they make the magnets move, it makes cones move, which makes us hear. But that's the same current that our brain uses. And so what we should be able to do is take some earbuds, cut off the pieces, the little earbud ends, and put some hooks on it. And with a little luck, we can put that current directly into the leg, and maybe we can see if we can make those legs move, just like Galvani did. Okay, so I've hooked it up there. I'm going to plug it into the sound. Please turn down the sound. I'm going to play it pretty loud. So I'm just hooking it in here. I'm going to choose some music. Can you guys see that? Can we get the, uh, the sound on the speakers as well? So there we go. So what's happening? So that cockroach leg is dancing to the music. And so it's not, it's not just fun and games that we do this. You know, it's kind of fun to play hip hop, but there's actually some real science going on here. And what it is, is that when the bass frequencies go, the bass have these really long frequencies, which have a lot of current, which causes the voltage to fire, and which causes uh, spikes to be able to send a message to the muscles to sort of allow the muscles to move. And so if you played something like Baroque opera that doesn't have bass, you won't see that. And so kids can immediately get to understand a lot of things that are happening in neurotechnologies, like how do you stimulate the brain? So it's not just uh, these things. You can also do other compelling things. This is uh, something that I worked on this summer uh, in Woods Hole. 
This is a squid, and squids are from a family of cephalopods, and cephalopods have the amazing ability to be able to change their colors almost instantaneously, and they use this for camouflage, and they also use this to sort of communicate with each other. But we can do the exact same cockroach experiment that we did here. So you can see I have a, an iPod, and I've plugged it into the nerve cells just, just like Galvani did, but now I'm doing it on the skin cells. And so what I'm looking at here is through the 8x scope, I'm just looking at a little piece of skin, and you can see what happens when you play music into that. Can you have the music up, please? Yeah, it's amazing. So what are these? These are called chromatophores, and what chromatophores are are the cells that allow the pigment to change, and so it allows the animal to change its, its sort of colors. And so there's brown ones, there's pink ones, there's yellow ones. But what we're doing is we're sending that same current into the nerve, which causes the muscles inside those cells to sort of open to the beat. And like I said, it's the bass frequency, so it kind of looks like it's dancing to the music, which is kind of nice. But how does that work in, in the high school classrooms and in the grade school classrooms? So fortunately, uh, here we were able to go with the TEDx kids and actually do this here in Brussels a few days ago at St. John's International School. So we made a little video showing how do the kids react when we do neuroscience in the classroom. So watch this. Uh-oh, it's moving. Now, now, bite on your teeth. No, really hard. Here, I'm biting. I did today about with the cockroaches, of course. The experiment was to take off the leg after putting it in cold water. It's a kind of under anesthesia, okay. and so we cut his leg. I a place where we put two pins in it, and then we put a kind of hooks around those pins, attach them to a sort of speaker, okay. and those pins are meant to pick up the neurons, electro signals. It's happening inside your brain right now. We've got 100 billion cells all making that electric message, right? We uh, let some music and uh, we let that through the pins go okay. into the leg okay. and it started moving. So now it's moving. Why is it? Because that low frequency carries the current, and that current is what causes these, these uh, neurons to fire. When these neurons fire, uh, you see the legs to move. Apparently, he likes Adele. Okay. He, li he likes the white stripes. He likes a few things, but a lot of things it doesn't like. It doesn't like. Do you, do you know why he didn't like some music? Because they're very high. Oh, so the frequency was different. Yeah. So there you have it. And those kids are in fifth grade, they're 10 years old, and that's actually a little bit early for our, for our educational outreach, but that, I mean, that kid was saying things that I didn't learn until I was in graduate school, so that makes me pretty excited. Uh, but you know, I want to talk about one more thing that we're working on. For every teacher that's willing to take bugs into the classroom and touch bugs and cut legs off bugs, there's probably about maybe 100 to 1,000 more that just don't want to touch those bugs, and so we're working on that. We have a new invention, which is called the Human Spiker Box that allows you to record neural activity from yourself. And so, if I can go to the next slide, you'll see that inside my arm, we have muscles, and these, the brain is sending signals to your muscles, and so if you listen carefully, I've hooked up a couple of electrodes here, and I should be able to record the neural activity is happening inside my muscles. And if we actually had smaller electrodes, we could actually record individual neurons talking to individual motor units and actually do the same things that we're sort of doing with the cockroaches, but now we're gonna do it with the, uh, with the human. So I just have a few more things I want to say. I just, uh, my last thing is uh, the latest and greatest in neurotechnology is brain-machine interfaces, things like cochlear implants and deep brain stimulation. We want to bring that experiment into the high schools as well. So we use uh, something called a hex bug. It's some, not something that we invented, but what it is, it's a remote control bug that allows you to go left and right. Okay, and so what you have is a remote control, and you have 
this thing that allows you to turn on DC motors. Remember, DCs are batteries. Batteries, we know, uh, are what causes, uh, that's the same electricity that's in our brain. So what we did is we made a little circuit board that, that takes that brain out of the, the robot and sort of ma modifies it so that it sends spikes. And we're going to send spikes into the antenna of the cockroach, okay? And then we're going to take advantage of the behavior of the cockroach. So when a cockroach is walking, he has his antenna on, it feels something on the right, it's going to want to turn and go left. And the same thing, if it goes to the left and it feels something, it's going to want to turn and go right. And so what we can do is use that remote control and sort of tell it by putting spikes into the antenna that it thinks it feels something, and with any luck, we can get it to work. So let's take a look at what happens here in this video. And so you see the cockroach walking with it. So when the light comes on, it's on the side of the stimulation. And you can see it turning in the opposite direction. So this is, and so this thing adapts over about five minutes. And so what's neat about this is that we brought, we've, we've actually sold over 100 of these kits, and they're going into high schools. And the high school kids are beginning to adapt them and hack them, and they're actually making it better. And so what we're doing is we're actually... Uh, listening to our customers, our, our high school kids, we now make it so they can work with, your, with your, uh, your iPhone, so you can actually talk Bluetooth. And so, ladies and gentlemen, this is the world's first commercially available cyborg in the history of all of mankind. So we're pretty proud of that. So that's why it's closed. I mean, we're, like, we're, we're a kind of a new uh, organization, but we're in 39 countries. Where we're growing, and we're, we're getting in more and more high school orders, and that makes me excited because our, our goal is that the today's high school students or today's grade school students will become inspired in neuroscience, want to become a neuroscientist, and help bring upon the neural revolution. Thank you.